All right, let me minimize this too. And that. Okay. Um, all right, so today we're gonna talk about um, op art. And op art is just simply um, short for optical art. Um, if you're not already familiar with it, uh, it really did have its heyday in the late 60s, early 70s, but it's still actually going on today. And optical art, meaning that it really does play with your optical perception. Um, as an official, uh, well, we did not get right into it. Um, in terms of the assignment, I addressed earlier that there would be two parts. Um, and I'll, I have this available, um, I already posted it on the Google Classroom, but the first part is essentially um, thumbnail, thumbnail sketches, okay? But they're a little bit more in, elaborate in terms of thumbnail sketches. I asked that they be done in black ink. And what you'll be doing is you'll be making four different thumbnail sketches. Um, don't freak out yet, because I haven't showed you examples of what I'm looking for yet. Um, you can use found photos with perspectival planes if you elect to, um, and you can trace it, but your final image must be yours. It must be completely original. So that means that whatever you take must be an amalgam. It must be a mixture of found sources, um, or it can be a completely original design. It's up to you. Um, and you'll know what I'm looking for by the end of this lecture. Um, I want you to create a dynamic space that abstractly represents perspective by reconfiguring and tracing from your archives of sketches. Do this in black ink, like I said. So um, I'm asking that there, there be a couple of things. I'm asking them fairly s executed in a simple fashion, but very neat. I'm asking that they be drawn inside either rectangles or squares. Um, do not give me any oblong or circular shapes or anything like that. I'm looking for within a rectangle or square format. I'm also asking that your, th your thumbnails be um, the dimensions of your board. That means, your bristle board. That means if you're, um, that if you're gonna do a four inch by six inch thumbnail, that your paper would be um, 16 by 20, right? So it would be the same ratio so that it can, you can easily scale it uh, up to your um, final scale. Um, I'm gonna ask that you include notes beside each sketch, indicating how the sketch will depict spatial depth, whether that be through your color choices or value. Um, and I want you to play with three things. I want you to play with scale or size, so the smaller shapes appear to be further away. I want you to play with perspective, which may, uh, which granted this isn't a 2D design class, so I haven't gone over perspective um, in depth, but if you do use um, images from online or source images that you've taken, uh, perspective can be uh, a concentration in that. And then of course, overlap. Um, oh, and those, um, those thumbnails will be due after week one, so November 9th. So one week from today, okay? So it's basically ensuring that you're staying on task and that you're executing the, the appropriate level of research in order to make your work rather than waiting the night before. This is not a night before project. Um, then the second step, which will have a separate due date, will give you two full weeks to do it. You're gonna be using two colors as a foundation to create a vibra vibrantly colored op art painting or optical art painting that agitates the eye or creates an extreme suggestion of motion. Use both the color choices and the design for this effect. Paint your original composition on a single sheet of your bristle board with at least a one inch taped border in any format in gouache or acrylic. Your page must be mostly filled with dense image. And I'll show you examples. The entire surface is painted except for paper border. Um, sorry, not paper board, but paper border. Um, everything within your image has paint on it, okay? And you must break the border cleanly if your design dictates. If you elect to work outside of the rectangle, rectangular configuration, please fill the space with dense visual information. You may elaborate your painting using pattern or alteration. Your color palette must adhere to one or the other, a monochromatic or in an analogous color scheme. Refer to your notes. Label your image in the description as either monochromatic or analogous and include which hues you used in your final Google Classroom upload. So do that in a private comment to me, please. So some student examples. Op art is meant to play with your perceptions regarding space. 
um, in that you're creating a painting or a two-dimensional work of art that is evocative of depth or motion, okay? And you can play with depth and motion either through the drawing, you can play with it with value, you can also play with it um, in terms of color. So here we have an example where the student is using this sort of projectile conical form um, that they've sort of doodled and created this suggestion of this um, interweaving of these forms. These two are student works where they, they are utilizing, um, they are utilizing uh, perspective as a means to do that. On the bottom lower right, we see the sort of gem-like focus, and then on the upper left, we see the sort of shard-like focus. Um, and you see the use of stacking, as well as this notion of scale in that smaller elements appear to be further away versus the larger elements. Um, if you were to execute something like this, I would, I would ask that you make sure that that white paper is covered with a color, please, or a value. Two more that deal with stacking more aggressively. Um, the bottom right-hand corner there really does deal with a, a, a very stringent approach to perspective. Are there any questions before I actually get into the lecture? No. Nothing? All right. Uh, there might be at the end, so make sure you jot it down in case you forget. Okay, so optical art. It's known as optical art, and it's a style of visual art that makes use of optical illusions. Um, and I'll talk about how to actually do that as we move forward. Optical art is a method of painting concerning the interaction between illusion and picture plane, between understanding and seeing. Op artworks are abstract, with many of the better known pieces made only in black and white. When the viewer looks at them, the impression is given of movement, hidden images, flashing and vibration, patterns, or alternatively of swelling or warping, such as in that image I opened up with. And that partially has to do with A, the color choices that are utilized. So the color choices are um, very close to complementary colors, but also the warping is suggested by um, very, very simply the soft, soft edge next to a very fairly hard edge. So if we look into the future, or we look into the past in terms of where this stuff was actually developed, um, it was actually developed by the Bauhaus. We talked a little bit about the Bauhaus, a lot about the Bauhaus before. Um, and so founded by the German school by Walter Gropius, they stressed the relationship of form and function within a framework of analysis and rationality. So the Bauhaus school, did I talk at length about the Bauhaus school in here? Yet? I don't remember. I remember you talking about kind of um, how they, um, like a certain like exhibits, I guess, the Bauhaus and like how they, of course, like supported form of form and function and how they were shut down by the Nazis. Good. I think that's all I remember. Yeah. Okay. So I did talk about it. So you know that they were, they were essentially this kind of model of a school that was really different than what you guys experience. It was this, you know, couple set of buildings, basically starting with this first building and people would show up and they would be respected as artists first. Um, and there was no delineation between you wanting to build tables versus you wanting to be a traditional painter. But they did deal with abstraction, and they dealt with abstraction in a way that really did look at it as a kind of science, the way that the eye actually reacts to the elements and principles of design. So the, the main reason why op art works really well is its use and understanding of color interaction. And color interaction, we've talked about before a little bit, um, it pertains to the idea that color perception is dependent on color relationships. So what does that mean? When you take two different colors, when you put them together, sometimes they react to each other. So what does that mean? Sometimes they'll vibrate. Sometimes they will look like they move. Sometimes the edges will look like they are lost. And this can be referred to as simultaneous contrast. It can be defined of as the ways colors interact or affect each other. And this can lead to the same color to a varied appearance, um, depending on its surroundings. So you see that this image is a little difficult to look at, right? You're going to have to help me out here because I won't move to the next slide unless you guys help me out. I have a couple of questions about this. Is this difficult for you to look at or is it easy for you to look at? 
That's a reference that's card to look at. So right. versus that one, is this easy to look at or difficult to look at? Difficult. It is. Okay. Tell me what's going on in this image that is not going on in this image. The red one and blue one is it's more loud. Why? What saturation? Good. It's saturation. Yeah. Also, if I were to take, if I were to ask you to squint your eyes at this which is the best way to determine what this would look like in terms of uh, value. Like if I took a Xerox copy of this, would it be in high contrast or low contrast? Squint your eyes. It's hard to make out, right? Now, if I ask you to squint your eyes here, it's easy to make out, correct? Yes. So when you squint your eyes, at an image and it's kind of hard to make out in all reality that probably means that it's very close in value so i want you to remember these two points when you have two colors that are really intense and really pure and they're next to each other and they're almost the same value you have an agitated eye when you have two colors that are high intensity and pure, and they are almost the same value, you have agitation. So that's the trick to making op art. Did you all just hear that and maybe write that down? Yeah? Yes. And I, I want you to notice that the longer you stare at this image, contrast at the bottom, that word contrast at the bottom, looks orange. It's not orange, it's red. So the longer you look at images, the more you have this sort of manipulation of not only your psyche, but your eye. So when artists know this tool, they can rule the world. When designers know this tool, they can rule the world. Now, if you wanna make something pleasant to look at, and easy to understand, you choose colors that are not highly pure and highly intense and that are absolutely different values in order to create contrast, real contrast. But regardless, I do want you to notice how contrast at the bottom, that word, still looks a little orange compared to the color up top. Do you see it? They're the same color. So, Simultaneous contrast also asserts that the color that you put around something affects the way you perceive a color. Do you all understand? So you just learned probably the two, three most important tenets you could ever learn in a color theory co course. I hope you wrote them down. Would you like me to repeat any of those? All right, moving forward. So... Basically, believe it or not, the person who's most responsible for op art and its popularity was a woman, Bridget Riley. And Bridget Riley was a British woman who essentially ruled the world with her really innovative, kind of spatially um, dynamic paintings. And she worked in um, she worked in primarily what's called emulsion. They used to call it emulsion. But basically, it's car modeling paint that was very, very flat. It was an industrial type of paint. She wanted a very clean, perfect look. Um, and she painted them on wood panel, which has been painted on since, well, 1,000, 2,000 years ago. Um, but she really focused on this sort of repeating um, uh, repetition pattern as a means to create these sort of um, moving forms. Some of them are fairly simple and just deal with edge and contrast. But you'll see that the majority of them that I start with do not have color in them at all. Believe it or not, that has no color in it. Here's another. 1965. And then a little drawing that she's done on paper. And every major, as we move forward and we think about um, her 
um, influence on the optical art movement, you could say. There's a couple of things I want you to pay attention to, and it oftentimes has to do with not only her color arrangements and her designs, but also how, how hard-edged they are. So op art, uh, by definition, oftentimes deals with edge. So if your intention is to create um, something structurally that is very geometric, you are going to probably have to approach this assignment with using your, um, your archival artist tape. Um, and you'll have to paint up to an edge and make sure that it's cleanly um, presented. However, if it's about um, losing an edge, then you want to probably work um, a little slower thinking about blending. But you'll notice that almost all op art, and these are, no, these are not actually hers, um, deal with the geometric edge, no matter how simple they may, might be. Um, oftentimes these artists will work on gridded paper as a means to create the design initially. Um, sometimes they don't. Um, sometimes ultimately it's just simply about play and uh, kind of cultivating an, uh, an already established knowledge base about very simple rules of, um, of perspective, such as maybe doing your name in block letters. Now, Optical mixing plays a big role in this as well. So as we all know, as we've already discovered through our, our weeks past, um, colors that dominate, that are pretty big, um, simply sit next to each other with their own independent um, identities. But as they get closer together in a linear form, they appear to optically mix in our heads. So that's something you could play with as well. So optical mixing still relies on a hard edge. However, it has to do with the thinness of a line. So this success can depend on the figure ground relationship. And a figure ground relationship is a term that you'll hear a lot in art school. Um, it is a dynamic visual art stemming from a discordant figure ground relationship um, that causes the two planes to be intense contradictory juxtaposition. Lots of art school words there. Op art is created in two primary ways. The first, the best known method, is the creation of effects through the use of pattern and line. Often these paintings are black and white or otherwise grisaille. Another reaction that occurs is that the lines create after images, sort of like that orange quality in the, the uh, contrast image that I showed you. Um, create an after image of certain colors due to how the retina receives and processes light. So as it relates to color interaction, this refers is referred to as simultaneous contrast. So a gray that is achromatic, so just black and white, no color in it, sat on a color field, such as that purple, will appear to take on another color. So it will appear to take on a kind of yellowish tone because it's the complement to the purple, which is where we get the word complementary color. A gray scare on a yellow background will look a little bit cooler, a little bit more violet. And then we have uh, reverse contrast. In reverse contrast, sometimes called the assimilation of color or the spreading effect, um, that is when the lightness of white or the darkness of black may seem to spread into neighboring regions. This sort of looks like an image is pulsating or moving. Um, similarly, colors may appear to spread into or become assimilated into neighboring areas. All such effects tend to make neighboring areas appear more alike rather than enhance their differences as the more familiar simultaneous contrast. Hence the term, oh, we got a guy coming. Oh, where's my thing? Um, hence the term reverse contrast. So reverse contrast um, ultimately, like I said, makes images appear or makes values appear as if they're moving and, and it will create a kind of pulsating effect. And you'll note that as I zoom in on this main image here, as we get closer and closer and closer, what looks to be a different, maybe a pink color that pulsates throughout is actually orange throughout. And this has to do with how thin the line is, not necessarily the contrast. So there's the full image. Another artist when talking about um, op art is Victor Vassarelli. And Victor Vassarelli, um, is really important because ultimately he's still making images that, that really do pull an image 
uh, pull your eye in in how he creates this notion of volume. And he creates volume by using oftentimes round shapes that may be comprised entirely of these sort of box broken shapes. Or he'll just create a similar repeating um, format or um, shape in order to create a kind of um, pendulating or a, a pattern-like space, much like v Bridget Riley. He would not exist if it weren't for Bridget Riley. Um, I do have a video clip, but I'm not going to make you watch it. Another way to create um, the notion of optical illusion, and if I were to get very, very close here, what you'd see are little letters. These are tiny little letters that have been typed up on a typing machine. Um, so you could consider this maybe a drawing because it's made out of ink. Um, but the optical part of this is the illusion that these are actually shapes that are solid. Uh, many artists are working today with um, playing on the notion of optical art rather than using actual photo Photoshop or any sort of Adobe Suite um, modifications. They're actually changing the illusion of space by integrating uh, or intervening on the actual subject. So here the subject is actually painted and placed in front of that pattern. Same. Same. And a fun little um, three-dimensional uh, sculpture that utilizes um, op art, or at least the, the swirling op art. Okay, I have a video here that I'm gonna go to. I'm, I need you to write it down. Um, I'm not gonna play it. It's a TED lecture. And the TED lecture is called Optical Illusions Show How We See by Bo Lotto. Um, a TED lecture is about 17 minutes long. It can be no longer than 17 minutes. So they're all short. Um, I need you to watch that. Um, he really gives a great explanation in terms of how we see and how our brain works um, as we see. So.